Good morning. Welcome to the Boardwalk Talk series brought to you by the Estuarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab. And this morning we are going to start with the first in a two-part series for, these, um, for this Boardwalk Talk. So uh, we thought to kind of reach into your homes or into your uh, vacation rentals where you're hanging out on the beach and um, kind of engage with you on the things that you might find on the beach, on a trip to the beach, either one that you are um, you know, currently taking or one that you may have taken in the past and look at some of the things that can be found on our Gulf Coast beaches and give you the opportunity to go on a scavenger hunt of your own on the beach um, or even around your house. A lot of people have beach treasures that they have found and taken home with them and they, um, you know, become part of their home decor. And so if you are not going to get out to the beach between now and June 2nd when we will have the second part of our uh, treasure hunt series then you can go on a scavenger hunt around your house and see how many of these things you might find or other things like them that you might be curious about have questions about want to share um, so we thought to start today out on our own beach um, on the south side of our campus However, uh, the weather outside is pretty uh, foreboding, and so we are going to use previously collected beach treasures to show you some of the things that you might find on our northern Gulf Coast beaches. So I will get into uh, showing you some examples of things that you might find and things that you might look for. Um, but if you have things that you would like to ask questions about, send us photos of, uh, we will leave a um, contact in the comments. So if you want to participate in this scavenger hunt, if you want to submit questions and pictures of your own finds, please do that before June 2nd. And on June 2nd, we'll pull up those pictures and questions and um, see what we can can um, answer for you or chat about those beach finds. All right, so um, we call this our beach in a box. So these are some of the common things that might be collected on our beach. And um, so then I've pulled out kind of an assortment of them to talk about. Um, so we've got some, I also have a um, magnifier. You might like to take a magnifier to the beach with you. Um, I have a jeweler's loop around my neck that I like to use to look at things closely. You kind of get a, um, a different idea of what you're looking at when you look at, at things very closely. So um, I've got an assortment of shells here. So one of the most common things that we associate with finding on the beach are shells. And um, these are mollusk shells. Sometimes we might find something like a sand dollar and we might refer to that as a shell. But that comes from a different group of animals. And we would call that a test rather than a shell. So a different group of animals. So I'm gonna, we'll talk about that one um, in a few minutes. We'll go back to the mollusks for now. But two of the most commonly found shells on our beaches um, are the moon snail and the oyster drill. And a lot of times they have hermit crabs in them. But the shells themselves are made by snails. So um, the shell is the hard part of the snail's body. They don't have bones, but uh, this is the hard mineral part of their body. And they hatch out of eggs. This is another thing that you might find on our beaches. A lot of times people look at this and think maybe it's some kind of snake skeleton, but this is an egg case for a snail. This is a, an egg case for a different kind of snail that is actually, um, this, this snail egg case was laid onto 
one like this. So this egg case comes from a uh, lightning whelk, this kind of snail, and this one, look at the purple in it, comes from the oyster drill. So when these animals hatch, they hatch with shells. So their bodies are connected to uh, the shells. And these are some um, lightning whelks that came, lightning whelk shells that came out of an egg case like this. So sometimes you can find these on the beach and they may have washed up and they may still have um, shells from some of the babies inside that didn't, didn't make it, didn't hatch. And so you can open the discs in the lightning whelk egg case and sometimes find these um, shells inside from the babies. Let me ask you something. So if somebody mm -hmm. was to find one of these egg casings mm -hmm. on the beach, and this one's kind of dried out because we've taken it out of the water and we use it on display. Mm -hmm. But if it seems like it's kind of fresh out of the water, can you put it back in the water and have them hatch? Is there a way to do that? Um, you could put them back in the water. Once they are washing up on the beach, they're kind of in the surf zone, and that energy is likely to return them to shore over and over again. So I would think that it's probably unlikely that they would um, move back into the water long enough to, for that to, to be a productive effort. But uh, if you want to try it, you know, just, just in the hopes that it might work, feel free to do that. Um, and I don't know that there's any um, evidence, any uh, you know, research that's been done on how, how effective that attempt may be. So that's just my guess that that probably would not result in you know the the babies um, surviving, but I don't know that for sure. Do you know how many lightning whelks can come out of an egg case like this? Um, I you know in my experience opening them, um, you will have several, uh, maybe up to ten in each of these discs, and so it kind of depends on the. Um, you know, the, the number of discs you have. And I'm not sure if that might be variable depending on the, the mother, the snail that lays the eggs. Um, so there may be a, some variability to that. I'm not sure, but each one of, you know, these could be up to hundreds of snails. And I, is there somebody mm -hmm. that, we've talked so much about lightning whelks and the egg casings and different chats, but. Is there somebody that kind of studies the lightning whelk and how many babies are born and what the life expectancy is of them once they're born? And, you know, because we know kind of like with octopus and seahorses about how many can live after they hatch. Is there somebody out there that's an expert on the lightning whelk? Undoubtedly, there is. <laughs> uh, but I don't have a name to give you. So um, maybe we could uh, see if we can find somebody who has studied lightning whelks um, or snails in general uh, to, to ask some questions of. Just kind of an interesting take yeah. on it. Um, and so as the snails grow, this one's kind of neat because so sometimes you can find these um, snails that have been broken and sometimes people, you know, want to, they, they kind of overlook these broken shells because they're looking for the whole ones. But it's kind of neat to see the growth pattern inside a broken shell. So that column that runs down uh, the middle is called the columella. This is the oldest point of the uh, shell. So it corresponds to that little knob on the, um, on the baby. And as they grow, they spiral outward like this. The, again, the body of the snail is attached to this shell, and the shell grows with the animal as the animal grows, much as our skeletons grow with us as we grow. So a little bit about the um, snails and, you know, their uh, growth and their, um, you know, their shells. And then we'll go back to these two common um, snails that we find on our beaches, often with hermit crabs in them. After the snails die and the soft parts of their body rot, leaving behind the um, shell, as some animals leave behind bones when they die, 
then sometimes um, hermit crabs will move into these, sna these snail shells. So when you find these on the beach, you're much more likely to find hermit crabs in these shells than the snails. But let's talk just a little bit about the snails themselves. <clears throat> this uh, is called an oyster drill snail. And this one is a moon snail, or it's a moon snail shell. There's no uh, snail living in there anymore in an oyster drill snail shell. Um, and they both drill holes in other animals' shells to eat them. So if you find, this is another common um, beach find that's pretty neat. And a lot of times this is kind of a, a mystery to people, how these holes got into these shells I have several of them so um, you know the these snails are are very active and you can find a lot of evidence of of this so they secrete an acid and they have a mouth part that's kind of like a raspy drill and they drill holes into these shells now these shells are made of um, calcium carbonite um, aragonite and they are pretty easily dissolved even by a mild acid. So an experiment that you could try is taking a little bit of a shell fragment. Let's see if I can find a small little, or you know, something very small, bit of a mollusk shell, and put it in a glass of vinegar, and you can uh, watch it dissolve. Actually, I've got, uh, we can set up this little experiment and see how far it goes. This is a chemical reaction, and it will go both ways. So um, this is vinegar. Um, and it will go both ways. So it would, you know, it would take a while. So you could, rather than dissolving the shell, you could neutralize the acid, depending on the ratio of acid to calcium. So if you think about, you know, if you might have, um, uh, you know, like acid reflux, you might take a calcium tablet like Tums. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's bubbling. You see the bubbling? Yeah, there it is, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, this reaction may stop as the uh, acid is neutralized by this uh, shell dissolving in there, but that's kind of a neat um, experiment that you could do. And so these snails use acid and they dissolve, these sh the, um, they dissolve a hole into the shell using a, their mouth part that's kind of like a little drill and then they um, will suck the animal out of the shell. Here's a snail was eaten by another moon snail. So um, then some of the other common uh, shells that you might find on our beaches. This one is called a, an olive. This is an olive shell. A couple of interesting things to note about this. It is shiny on the outside. And uh, that is true for, for some kinds of shells. But a lot of them, um, you find that smoother surface on the inside and the outside of the shell is a lot more rough. So um, for those snails like the olives and cowries, which are not native here, but sometimes people are uh, familiar with the cowrie shells, they're very shiny on the outside. So when those animals come out of their shells, and again, they're not crawling out completely, but when they come out enough to crawl around, um, they wrap their um, mantle, which is part of their body, around the outside of their shell. And they are secreting um, shell material there. And um, so the, a lot of snails move uh, with their, the, um, their foot. They have a suction cup foot. And they'll move with the, the shell, you know, kind of, um, they move beneath the shell. The shell is on top of them for protection. But some of them will, as they come out, they wrap the, their mantle around their, um, the outside of their shell. And another thing to note about this cowrie is that it's not very commonly found on our beaches except when we have had beach renourishment projects. So 
when there is a big volume of sand that is scooped up out of the Gulf of Mexico and brought and deposited on our beaches. We find a lot of these cowries uh, in that deposited sand. So right now on the east end of Dauphin Island, um, on the beach that is south of the Sea Lab, we are finding a lot of things like cowries and um, you know, in that we're also finding some fossils that may not be found on the beaches except when the sand has been scooped out of the Gulf and brought and deposited onto the beach. Um, so there's some interesting things that you can find in those sand deposits as well. This is another kind of whelk. Um, so this one is the lightning whelk and this one is a channeled whelk. The lightning whelk is unusual because it opens on the left side. Uh, if you point the apex, this, the oldest part of the shell away from you and look at the opening, the lightning whelk opens on the left side. Almost all other shells open on the right side. Kind of hard to tell with the moon snail because it is so round, but is there a reason for that or is it just just the way they're made well um i'm not sure so you know um there may be a some kind of functional reason for it but i'm not sure what that is maybe if we find a malacologist who studies that's a person who studies um mollusks then maybe we can ask if they uh know the reason why uh lightning whelks open on the left side or maybe there's a future malacologist that's watching yeah my, that may be a question that has not been answered. And so, um, you know, we're always um, asking questions in science and looking for the answers. So sometimes there are questions and, and we just don't, we don't know the answers to them. So that is an opportunity to investigate. So another common mollusk shell found on our beaches are oysters. Oh, go back to this real quick. Is that, you said olive snail or cowrie snail? This one is an olive. Okay, so what's, and then the cowrie, do we have one of those? I do not, but they are, um, a lot of times they have kind of like leopard, they look like they have kind of leopard spots on them okay. and they're um, kind of elongated. And on the underside, the opening is kind of in the middle and it looks kind of like, Kind of like this. And a lot of people are familiar with them. Like they're often used oh, I know in jewelry, what you're about. like necklaces yep. and stuff. They're not native here, but just because a lot of people know them, I mentioned them. Um, so the oysters, some interesting things to note about oysters. Oysters are very ecologically important here. And um, we are in our classroom that's right here on Mobile Bay. Um, oysters. Uh, are an important habitat. So oysters are bivalves. They are animals with two shells and they like to uh, stick to hard things. They cement themselves to hard things. So they have a drifting larval phase. So when they hatch, they will drift in the currents um, until they find a suitable um, place to settle and attach themselves. And studies have shown that um, they, now they will attach to like pylons, piers, different things like that, but studies have shown that they are um, more likely, they, they seem to be attracted maybe to um, chemical signals in the water, to other oysters. So when oysters attach to other oysters, they form reefs. So these reefs are very ecologically important for other species that settle on them. They will find shelter within the oyster shells, among oyster shells. Um, and so you can see some evidence of some other animals. These tracks that you see in this oyster were made by worms. So there are worms that will uh, like burrow into the oyster shell itself. There, now this oyster is no longer living. So, um, you know, the animals that settle onto it may settle onto oysters that are part of that reef but are not, no longer living, or they may settle onto oysters that are still living. Um, you can see a little like bump right here where there's a hole. 
There may have been a worm called a blister worm inside there. So they may live inside the shell. Um, and then this one had a, this is not an oyster, but these worms will also live on oyster shells. So there are worms that rather than burrowing, they make like a calcareous, a hard uh, tube that they live in. Uh, barnacles will live on oyster shells. Uh, there are fish and crabs that will live uh, in the oyster shells and among the oyster shells of the reef. So here are some barnacles, not on an oyster, but just as an example of how oysters will settle and live on um, something hard. There is actually a small oyster attached to this beer can. So it attached to something hard. There's another one. And then... Um, Barnacles also like to attach to hard things, and often they will attach to uh, oysters. And so this, when you, and this also had a snail lay an egg case on it. Back to the barnacles, we mm -hmm. typically will see those when when you see them like out of the water, they are they are not alive, right? Uh, well, I mean oysters, I mean uh, barnacles are, you know, they breathe with gills, so they need to be in the water to breathe. So usually, when you find them out of the water. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty likely that they are not alive. Um, but, you know, they could be out of the water for a few minutes. So if you saw something um, like in a low tide and then the tide came back. So, for example, there are rocks at the, you know, on the uh, beach south of Asila. If you saw uh, barnacles out there and they were exposed to the air, they were not covered by water, they may... Um, you know, survive for that period where they're exposed, and then when the water comes back, you know, they're they're still living. That they may be uh, fine, but yeah, generally, if they're washing up on the beach, they are not alive. And so you can see a lot of times you see them with they kind of look like little volcanoes where they're open. When they are alive, they have these two little articulating parts. I don't know if you can see that. Now these are not alive, but the, the other parts that I'm pointing out have not uh, fallen out of these barnacles. So they will kind of open and close like this. They can open and close. And barnacles, barnacles are not mollusks, although they look a lot like oysters. They are actually crustaceans. They're related to crabs. And so they feed by sweeping out this little feather-like structure, feeding structure. So they'll sweep it out through the water and grab little food particles out of the water and bring it back, back into their um, bodies, to their mouths. So, so this is a barnacle too? It is, and this one is an offshore species. So these are pretty common, uh, commonly found on the beach uh, if they you know, break off in chunks of whatever, from whatever they were attached to. Um, they may wash up on our beaches, but they don't grow and live inshore. So something kind of interesting to note about these is if you find something that has the big pink ones attached to them, like this one has uh, different species of barnacle attached to it, but if you find one with these, then that is an indication that whatever that was that you have found on the beach spent some time uh, drifting or maybe sunken and then washed up on the beach, but time out farther from shore, out in deeper water. So shore. do these grow, would you find these like growing on a rig? <clears throat> um, or would they grow on this, like a seafloor bottom? Can they grow sandy bottom or like an actual they, hard bottom? Yeah, they like to attach to something hard. Okay. So, um, you know, rigs, um, you know, uh, wood, even uh, driftwood, drifting wood. Rocks. Do we have some driftwood with us? Some oysters. Um, yeah. And so here's some driftwood and something. So, I mean, there's this, just the things that you can find on the beach are innumerable. So we may only get to a small portion of these things that I've pulled out to show you. But, you know, we can just follow our curiosity. But driftwood so, is a lot cooler than people think it is. Like, if you really take a look at it. So this is a piece of driftwood. I don't see any barnacles in this, although there may be some small ones. But barnacles will attach to driftwood. 
but the uh, all of these holes were made by an animal called it's called a shipworm but it's not actually a worm it is a clam so let me see if i can find one that is still in there you can see the kind of the white in there is kind of the um, calcareous layer that they put down um, these look there may be some barnacles in there um, but I don't see any of the actual clams but the clam itself is kind of long and skinny this is a clam it's not a shipworm um, doesn't doesn't really look too much like a shipworm shipworm is more long and skinny like clams each clam has a foot snails have a foot it is a characteristic of mollusks they have a foot and for the snails it's a suction cup foot for clams uh, it's a long skinny muscle that almost looks like a tongue and so different clams use that foot for different purposes so some of them will burrow into um, sand. Some of them will um, use it to push along the bottom, kind of move. Well, the shipworms burrow into wood. And we call them ship, shipworms rather than driftwood worms as we're more concerned with them drilling holes in ships than, uh, than in, in driftwood. And so wood, wood hulled ships would have to put some sort of protective coating on, on the hull um, to prevent the hull from looking like this. You don't want your ship's hull to look like this. <clears throat> so going back to the oysters, they provide very um, important habitat for a lot of animals in our estuary. And they're also economically important. So a lot of people like to eat oysters. So not only is this a food source for people and for you know, animals out in the estuary, but um, it's, a, it's a livelihood for a lot of people. So there are people whose livelihood is um, harvesting these oysters, transporting them, processing them, shucking the oysters and packaging them, um, you know, uh, cooking them, serving them. So a, so in addition to this being very ecologically important as habitat, as a food source for animals in the bay, you know, they serve a lot of important ecological roles. They're also economically valuable. They're a food source and they're a source of, um, you know, uh, they contribute to our economy. So we've looked at some of the common things that, you know, the shells that you may find. What are some of the uncommon things that people come across on the beach? Something that they may not realize that they're looking at. Okay, um, so these, now I'm, I'm, I'm showing you things that you can find on our beaches. So they may be unusual, but they're, but they're there. Uh, you know, they, you can find them on our beaches. So these are a couple of uh, sea beans. They're called sea beans. <clears throat> they are, this one's called a hamburger bean. And that one, this one's called a heart bean. And these are seeds from tropical trees. And so these probably came from, um, you know, South Florida or from the uh, Caribbean. And they, these trees will drop their seeds in the water. And the, wa and the water will, um, they will be carried in these water currents. And um, usually they'll wash up on shore somewhere in the tropics where they can sprout and grow uh, into trees there. Sometimes they end up in currents that carry them all the way up to the northern Gulf of Mexico uh, and they wash up on our beaches and they're not going to sprout here. <clears throat> it's not the right climate for them. So, you know, it's an unusual beach find, uh, but once in a while we do find them here. What about bones that people might pick up on the beach? Okay, so I also want to note that, um, you know, we, there are some things that are prohibited from, you're prohibited from collecting some things. So um, this would be an example of something that can be found on our beaches sometimes, but um, you are prohibited by law from collecting uh, this particular um, item because it is it comes from a protected species. So I'm going to give you just a second to kind of 
look at this. Think about what this might remind you of. Um, think about, you know, is this bone? Is it stick? Is it um, shell? And then I'll reveal what it is. So this is bone. And maybe it reminds you of, um, you know, barbecue. So for those of you who like to eat barbecue, you may recognize this as a rib bone. It is a rib bone. It is a rib bone from a sea turtle. So sea turtles are protected species. You're not allowed to collect any parts of, uh, or have possession of any parts of sea turtles. Um, but it's kind of interesting to look at this and think about it. A lot of people, I think, don't uh, understand what part of the, uh, what part of the body, how that shell relates to something familiar. So um, a turtle's shell is its rib cage. If you feel your ribs in the front and the back, you know, that kind of uh, can, can tell you what a, what a turtle's shell is. So they do have shoulder bones and hip bones, but they are encased within their rib cage. So their rib cage is expanded to in, encase the shoulders and the hips. So these are ribs from a sea turtle, and in fact, we have a reporting system for um, turtles that have been stranded. So, um, you know, whenever there are sea dead sea turtles that wash up, um, you know, we like to try to document those. So, <clears throat> if you find dead sea turtles, uh, don't collect them. That is. Uh, prohibited by law by the Endangered Species Act and um, you know report them to the uh, stranding network and we have these we should say because of education purposes right so we have permits to hold um, uh, parts of protected species in order to teach people about them and this is another find that people come across on the beach all the time, right, Mendel? Yeah, so people will find these and often they don't know what they are. And they almost look like plastic. Um, they kind so, of feel like it too. Uh-huh, and they're light. These are egg cases from a skate. A skate is a fish that looks a lot like a stingray. They're related to stingrays. There's a picture of a illustration of a skate in a, that's kind of an artificial, um, representation you know you wouldn't see it like that but it's kind of an artificial representation of what that is and their nickname is the mermaid's purse so um and you can hear they're they kind of kind of gives you an idea of what they feel like um so they're kind of hard but um light and thin and um when these are first laid, they're a lot softer than this, and they will harden up when they wash up and dry out. In this one, you can hear something rattling around in there. That is likely the, um, babe, the, the remains. They don't have bones. They're not bony fishes, but the um, cartilaginous, the hard remains of the skate that, that didn't survive, that didn't hatch. Um, sometimes you'll find them... And it's hard to see, but this one hatched. So there is a, I don't know if you can even see it, but there is a crack in this one. So that one came out of this egg case and then the egg case washed up on the beach. Interesting. Um, and so you don't hear that inside this one. And this one has um, eggs that were laid onto it. And I think those are probably snail eggs. They look like it. And interesting to note, so skates, are they a fish or are they? They are a fish. They're not a bony fish, but a cartilaginous fish. They're related to stingrays and sharks. So um, they look a lot like stingrays, uh, but they lack that barb. And um, so, some people are familiar with these egg cases and they think of them as shark egg cases. So in some parts of the world, there are sharks that lay egg cases that look similar to this. So sometimes people are familiar with that. 
Um, around here, we don't have sharks that lay egg cases that look like that. So, um, you know, so when these wash up on our beaches, uh, you know, these are skate eggs. So I think this is another. This is this is another cool beach find, but this this one happens to be broken, so it's not the best um, example. But we can show it, and um, maybe we can pull out a better example for next time. So this is a skull of a hardhead catfish, and this catfish is also called a crucifix catfish. So this would be the mouth side, and then the skull. And if you flip it over, um, it would it. When it's whole, you can see this broken edge and this broken edge. It has a, um, you know, a, a sort of a long skinny line there that looks like arms. So it looks like a crucifix. Inside, you hear that rattling? There's a little, some rattling in there. So these are the um, ear stones of this fish, the otoliths, O-T-O-L-I-T-H ear stones and um, that those ear stones float freely in their skull in that cavity those cavities and they help the fish position itself in the water so it knows whether it's kind of listing to the left listing to the right whether it's upside down um, so those uh, are used by our researchers for um, some you can tell some really cool things from about a fish from the otoliths so the otoliths can be sectioned, kind of like uh, trees, and you can count the, the um, growth rings in them, and so you can age a fish by the otoliths. Also, they, a fish can be identified by its otoliths. So for example, if, you have, uh, if you're looking at stomach contents and you find otoliths, then you can, you can know, you can identify those fish and know what the one whose stomach contents you're examining, what it was eating. Also, you can do something really cool with them. Um, you can do an isotope analysis where you're looking at the chemicals in those different growth rings. And uh, so you can match it to an isotope signature for different water bodies. So you could, for example, match an isotope signature to Mobile Bay and say, well, this fish lived in Mobile Bay until it was a year old, and then you get in that in that year old ring, the, an isotope signature for a different water body like the Gulf of Mexico that moved out into the Gulf of Mexico when it was one and then you do further um, matching of those isotope signatures to the different rings and say, well, it came back into Mobile Bay when it was three years old. So some really interesting things that you can learn from the otoliths. Um, and then, oh, well, I said I was going to come back to the uh, sand dollar, so I will do that um, to kind of wrap it up. And we do have other things that we haven't talked about, but you know, we can, we can, we could talk all day about things you can find on the beach. So a sand dollar is an echinoderm. They are in a group of animals with sea stars and uh, sea urchins and sea cucumbers. <clears throat> they have some common characteristics, including the five-part symmetry. And then the if you flip the sand dollar over, this is its mouth, and it, you can see in there some of the mouth parts that are moving. They have five mouth parts that sort of look like doves. People sometimes mistake them for shark's teeth. They're pretty common on uh, our beaches, um, especially with sand that has been pulled up and deposited. These animals themselves, although they can be found on beaches, um, sand dollars and sea stars, they are not very common on our beach because they do not have a very high tolerance for low salinity water. They thrive in salty water. And our water, um, has freshwater influence. So this is a Mobile Bay estuary. An estuary is a place where freshwater and saltwater meet and mix. And here's Dauphin Island right here. We are on the east end of Dauphin Island. If we look out that window right there, we are looking at Mobile Bay. 
And um, so this is the watershed of Mobile Bay. Here's Mobile Bay right here. So the watershed is the area of land that drains to a particular body of water. In this case, Mobile Bay, and we've traced all the rivers and streams that flow into Mobile Bay back to their source. And the land that that drains is the watershed. Well, Mobile Bay has a very large watershed. And every day, on average, about 42 billion gallons of fresh water flows into Mobile Bay. And there in the bay, water from the um, watershed and water from the Gulf of Mexico mixes together, making brackish water. So the water is still salty, but it's lower salinity than the water out in the Gulf of Mexico. And once that brackish water exits Mobile Bay, the currents, the, the currents in the northern Gulf of Mexico <clears throat> Uh, flow east to west, that longshore current does. So after that brackish water exits Mobile Bay, it flows west along Dauphin Island. And so you've got this brackish water influence here, and the um, sand dollars and sea stars, you know, they thrive in much saltier um, <clears throat> habitats. So we don't find many live sand dollars and sea stars on our beach, but we do find you know, the, the remnants of them, the, the mineral part that they leave behind after they die. So Mendel is, we're encouraging people to come to us with their beach finds, whether it's an egg casing or a shell, they can also send us pictures of fish they may see in the water or things they may yeah. see along if the side. If you see it on the beach and you just take a picture and you don't take it home with, it, with you, that's fine. Um, if you send it to us ahead of time, we'll try to, you know, identify those things for you. If you have questions about them, about identification or about their lives um, or about some phenomenon that you notice, you know, we want to hear from you and engage with you. And we want you to, to get out into your um, local vacationing or whether you live near the coast, or um, you know, even if you are just reconsidering a past beach trip, or just finding things you know, that you're curious about that um, came from the ocean that you have in your home. And um, we, you know, we may do some of these in the future where we just want you to get out in your backyard and, and look at things. So um, you know, our attendance has picked up in the aquarium but we know that some people still are um, you know maybe not getting out as much as they were before the getting out into public places as much as they were but you know before the pandemic so um, we would like to to come to you I um, mean you know engage with you where you are and that June 2nd that we're going to share what people share with us, we're going to identify things. And then on May 19th, who are we chatting with? On May 19th, we're going to talk to Dr. Sean Powers about uh, the snapper fishery and the great snapper count. And um, that will be just, we'll, we'll do that just ahead of the opening of snapper season. So that should be exciting. And then our last thing that I'm going to have you mention is Ask the Aquarist is coming back, isn't it? Yeah. So you guys have an opportunity to um, hear from our aquarists about different things that they do and different animals that they take care of and, um, and ask them questions. And is, uh, what, our first one is scheduled for? It's the fourth Thursday of every month that we'll do it. Okay. So May 28th, I think, is our first one. All right. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time.